By the time we're eating lunch today, Louisiana will have lost about a football field's worth of land to the sea. While we know the extreme land loss here is due to a lot of local factors, behind that is something more insidious. Coastal communities around the world are experiencing sea level rise firsthand, part of a global pattern of climate change. Understanding climate change, especially the role the oceans play in it, is essential to provide the best information for resource managers, civil engineers, and vulnerable communities so that we can build a more resilient tomorrow. My PhD focuses on studying how the oceans, specifically the surface oceans, have changed throughout the past. At first, I thought that would be simple. Get some data, some analyses, bada bing, bada boom, dissertation. Oh, imagine my horror when I found out that prior to the 50s, there's almost no observational data for the Gulf of Mexico. Oh boy. Uh, rather than give up though, I decided if people hadn't recorded it, I'd find something that did. And thank goodness did I find something. I found the stony corals that call the Gulf and the Caribbean home. Unfortunately, there was still a problem. Unlike people, corals don't keep written records. To be fair, it's very hard to write without thumbs. Instead, they record the conditions of the waters they grow in in the chemistry of their skeletons, in elements like strontium and in isotopes like those of oxygen. My work now focuses on translating the history of the seas that are recorded in this coral chemistry and turning it into useful sea surface data so that we, as scientists, can produce useful information to pass on down the line. Effectively, I want to take the corals, the pasts that they've lived, and use that to inform our climate future. Good morning. So our coastal culture is connected to recreational diving and fishing for economically important species such as red snapper and greater amberjack. Now offshore oil and gas platforms are the majority of these diving and fishing expeditions originating on the Louisiana coast. And approximately 2,000 of these structures are currently in operation in the Gulf of Mexico. Now underneath the surface, a diverse world exists on these structures. So as you can see from these platform legs, they are covered with various marine organisms, corals, sponges, and encrusting algae, which in return provide food for other crustaceans, reef fish, and predators. So it's very own little food web. However, in past research conducted on these oil rigs, the artificial light gradient has often been overlooked. Active man platforms utilize bright floodlights for nighttime operations, illuminating the surrounding water column potentially impacting this once nocturnal environment. So from this image, you can just visualize just how one of these structures could potentially impact the underwater fish communities. So questions arise. How do these light fields affect fish behavior? Do they cause the aggregation of certain prey items? And do they increase foraging opportunities? So these are just some of the questions that I would like to address in my master's research, which is geared toward looking at the effects of artificial light on the diets of predators through gut content analysis and stabilized tope analysis. But what does that mean? In other words, I want to look at the stomachs of these predators to get a snapshot of what they ate for dinner. And then I want to use stabilized isotopes, which are natural chemical compounds in the muscle tissue, to look for long-term diet trends. Now combining both of these practices will allow us to see how these predatory fishes are utilizing their environment. Now red snapper and other pelagic predators are being collected off the Louisiana coast from two active man platforms, like this image, and two inactive platforms that are only minimally lit at night for navigation. Now comparing these two types of habitats will allow us to see the potential influence of artificial light. Now, it's a little too early in my study to see any real long-term diet trends, but I do hope you stay in touch from the future for these exciting findings. Now, solving the mystery of artificial light influence will allow us to see how these fish communities and predators are utilizing platforms as habitats 
as well as provide additional tools and knowledge for future fisheries management in the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you. As a boy growing up in South Louisiana, I was amazed by the vastness of our coastal wetlands, but I was equally devastated by the destruction of hurricanes. In 1992, as a result of a power outage from Hurricane Andrew, I dropped a can of soup on my toe. In 2005, family members from New Orleans visited following Hurricane Katrina. And in 2012, though I had moved out of my parents' house, we once again reunited after Hurricane Isaac. Though these power outages are socially and economically very important, more impactful to me were the devastating effects on coastal wetlands. Islands disappeared before my eyes, the coastal marshes changed shape literally overnight, and trees had been snapped in half, including the bald cypress in our backyard. My dad worked all his life just to play in these wetlands on the weekends, and I vowed that my work would literally involve playing on, in these wetlands constantly. So I had three requirements for my thesis. One, that they would take place in the coastal wetlands I came to love. Two, that they involved the dynamic effects of hurricanes. And three, that they involved some type of field component. My topic today is a, very, is a fairly new field of research. Dendrotempestology, a, t a, term I've, a term I've coined, is literally the effects of hurricanes on trees. More specifically, the damaging effects from high winds and storm surge on the growth of these coastal trees. <laughs> Fortunately, these trees lay growth bands every year, and as you can see in the image above, these growth bands are se severely decreased after the occurrence of a hurricane. Currently, my research only looks back about 80 years, but if we can find older trees, and I'm pretty sure we will, <coughs> we can extend the knowledge of the known record of hurricanes, and in that way we can increase our predictive force of future hurricane occurrences. Additionally, these will keep people out of harm's way and improve our ecological knowledge of the devastating effects of hurricanes. Thank you. As we know that number of studies have been conducted on uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PASs, in the northern Gulf of Mexico especially after Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010, mainly focusing on their toxicity and accumulation on foods and, uh, food and sediments. However, there is a huge knowledge gap on how long this toxic compound will stay in the upper water column before being removed. In fact, there is not, not even a single study on residence time of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the northern Gulf of Mexico. It needs to be studied even study even uh, without a oil spill situation because there are a number of other sources of PASs to the water column, such as atmospheric deposition, river inputs, and numerous natural well seep. Therefore, the objective of my research is to study whether the vertical shocks of particulate PASs is an important PASs loss and what is the resistance time of particulate PASs in the upper ocean. To do that, I collected dissolved, suspended, and sinking particles from uh, different locations in the northern Gulf of Mexico. The collection of suspended and sinking particles from open ocean is uh, extremely challenging job. This is the reason why there are no such study in this area. For example, we had to collect and filter about 800 liters of uh, water to get a single particulate PAS sample, and which was done by using specially designed large volume density pumps like this. And the other challenge was to collect enough amount of sinking material for the PAS analysis, which was done by using drifting sediment traps like this. And once we get the uh, total particulate PAS inventory from the pump and flux from the trap, we can divide one by the other to get the daily loss. And the daily loss of particulate PAS were used to calculate their resistance time in water column. The <laughs> graph here has the uh, concentration of particulate PASs, and this one shows the fluxes. And as I mentioned before, once we divide uh, concentration from the flux, we can get the daily loss, and it was used to calculate the resistance time of PASs in the water column. And we found that about two, 
uh, 2 to 8 microgram of uh, particulate PAHs were sinking from every meter square of uh, area every day. That <coughs> leads to the loss of about 7% uh, of total particulate PAHs every day from the upper wa water column. This is a significant am amount of loss which indicates that vertical fluxes of particulate PAHs can be an important loss term for uh, PAHs in this region. This gives us the residence time of about 15 to 52 days in the water column. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my topic is on the rainstorm event on coastal coral reef water and we're trying to access the change of TSS, which is an important water parameter. So coral reef is an important um, and a, a significant um, reserve area in terms of its biodiversity effect. So um, basically, this is our study area, and we just want to see the changes brought by the uh, rainstorm events. So we look at this area, we apply a model to it, and we re retrieve the, um, the changes, spatial temporal changes of the TSS on this area. So um, the reason we chose this study site because of it's the only um, coral reef area along mainland China, so it's kind of significant. And also, we um, in the future we want to um, study the whole system of the ecosystem house by studying other parameters. Uh, like the petroleum and the phytoplankton. So we want to re rebuild um, regression model as a whole and study the area ecosystem as a whole. So basically, our major finding is simple because we found the significant uh, increase of TSS in the um, area, which is map B. Uh, and that is two days after the event. So it's right after the rainstorm. But five days after the event, like map C, we found like it's lower than before. So we assume that it's probably because there are lower intensity of human activities because it didn't resume yet. So that's one assumption, but also probably because of other factors like wind or time changes. So we're gonna explore that in the future work as well. So that is very difficult to find because it doesn't happen in every area. So that's just a case study in our area, but we want to apply that model to other study sets as well. So, but it requires validation of the model. So that's the basic finding and it's very significant uh, considering the significance of the study area. So um, basically this model, it facilitates the tracking of water course change in the relatively turbid water as in our case, and it's cost and time efficient when compared with traditional masters. And for future, we want to evaluate, um, explore more models for other parameters, as, as I said, and we want to regret, um, build a regression model using all these parameters. So yeah, and that check basically tells us how we start about this program project and why we want to choose this study set. I want to change the, um, check the TSS change and also want to find the water quality and study. In future, we want to study more events so that we we'll find a pattern change, uh, pattern of changes. So that's the basic idea. So thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to assume that since I am in a room with a lot of coastal scientists, and we are in southern Louisiana, that quite a few of you have been offshore to the offshore oil rigs. And you might have noticed, and have definitely noticed thanks to Kristen's presentation, that at night, the active platforms are brightly lit up, kind of like Christmas trees, whereas the inactive rigs actually appear abandoned and are in, fa are in fact only lit for navigational purposes. Now what we really wanted to untangle with this study is the effect or the lack of effect that this light has on the fish community. So we were looking at what lives where, but more importantly, who eats who. And in order to do this, we dropped high definition video cameras into the water. Uh, a lot of our screens look something like one of these two slides. Either you have big blue empty ocean, or you have these huge schools of something like snapper, which are very difficult to get an accurate count on. 
But every now and then, we got something really impressive. Uh, my favorite are my yin yang sharks uh, and this grouper, which immediately proceeded to try to eat my vid video camera. Um, essentially, we were operating under the assumption that the lit platforms, because they are lit 24 7, would have more predators and that they would have a higher abundance of fish as a whole. And it turned out that the opposite was true. So we saw more fish, more predators at these unlit platforms. And essentially, um, what we found was that there was a huge stratification in the water column. So near the surface, you have all these barracuda, you have all these jacks, versus near the bottom, it's almost exclusively grouper and snapper. Um, so really, for all you anglers out there, what this means, if you're looking to catch the next big one, I would highly suggest that you go to an offshore inactive oil platform. But more importantly for policy and management implications is that these inactive platforms have the ability to support a viable and diverse uh, habitat community. And really they should be treated and protected and managed as artificial reefs under an artificial reef program in the Gulf. Thank you. We're here in Louisiana, so I don't have to tell you what remarkable ecosystems coastal wetlands are. However, 50% have been lost globally, including at a rate of about a football field an hour here in this state. So there's been an increased interest in wetland restoration. We're talking about growing new wetlands. Now, if there are any gardeners in the room, they could tell us how important soil is if you're trying to grow something. And in fact, uh, soil microorganisms have been shown to be crucial in sustaining healthy ecosystems, but their role in restoration ecology is rarely recognized. So I want to know, how do different wetland types, uh, how do the soil microbial communities vary between different wetland types? So two of these are restoration sites, and plants will be planted in the dirt, but and maybe fertilized, but we don't know how the microorganisms in the soil are supporting the success or the failure of these very important projects. So, um, in restoring old agricultural sites, it often takes many years, oops, it, in restoring old agricultural sites, it often takes many years uh, for wetland species to recover. Um, seed bank transfers help, but we don't know if it's just the seeds or if it's the soil organisms that are being transferred with the seeds that are supporting the development of these ecosystems. So I want to know, um, or so I plan to collaborate with researchers at the USGS uh, National Wetlands Research Center and with restoration managers at the Jean Lafitte National Park who are actively seeking better restoration strategies for just such sites. Um, so the image in the upper left is a root fungi called a mycorrhiza. It forms a beneficial association with the plant roots, providing nutrients to the plant. And it also looks a bit like glue. And it functions in a similar way, binding soil particles together, creating a more sta stable soil structure, which is frequently a problem we face in wetland restorations. These were discovered in wetlands two decades ago, but we don't know what role they play in plant development but they have been used successfully in forest restorations, and I think that they could be a missing link in our wetland restoration projects. So how will I find out what microorganisms are in the soil? Fortunately for me, DNA sequencing technology has come down in cost in recent years, allowing us the opportunity to catalog microorganisms in the soil based on their DNA. And now I breathe a sigh of relief because only about 10% of organisms can be grown in a petri dish, which is helpful but doesn't really give us a full estimate of what's in the soil. So I plan to do this in different wetland types like we saw to see how microorganisms affect the wetland function. If microbes in the soil affect the soil development, it would have important implications for restorations worldwide. <laughs> 